They say never work with kids or animals. So naturally, here I was, making a movie starring only kids and animals that I was going to have to create from scratch. I had no idea if any of this was going to work. I mean, what guarantee did I have that it wasn't going to look stupid and that all this work wasn't going to be in vain? None. I had none guarantee. But on everything I've ever made, I've learned time and time again that the best way to find out if something's going to work is to just try it. I think this is the first time that I've ever done any creature design for Seth. Not only did they need to look like they had you know, sprung from children's drawings, but then they had to look actually scary once they were realized. This is exactly how it'll look in the film. <laughs> when you're working on creatures, there's a lot of tropes that usually involve darker colors and that, and I thought it was gonna be fun to make something that needs to look cute, but it also needs to look scary and ferocious. If a little girl has to save the world by hunting monsters from her own imagination, there's really no reason she can't do it while rocking pink unicorns, rainbows, and kitty cat stickers. I mean, while we knew that several scenes needed to be dark and moody, we made every effort to incorporate as many bright colors and textures as possible. With our budget, we ended up cramming everything into a two and a half day shoot. The first day would be a skeleton, and then the second two days would be full on production. We can only work with the kids for a maximum of eight hours a day, and so we really have to maximize our schedule around those kids' schedules. In order to accomplish everything I'd ambitiously laid out in the script, our first AD, Dwayne Logan, laid out a very tight and efficient schedule, working from my shot list and storyboards that I created using my plot device's storyboard notebook, as well as my animatics I'd created in After Effects using ProLost Bordo. Chris and I agreed that if we wanted to play with the horror genre by bringing these childish elements into it, then we needed to fully commit to other staples of the genre, which is why we get this beautiful, dreary, naturalistic mood and those long, dreadful zooms. We got the Lex Mini Elite Anamorphics, and then we got this crazy old Russian zoom lens. We've named Natasha the Beast because it's like 25 pounds. Ridiculous. This grab is a baby. It, grab it by this. You can have one mechanism. of the kids hang on the back of the camera to balance it. <laughs> Thanks. How fast are you going to be running? You're going to be running lightning speed. Amber is a character that has a lot more than what you see on the surface. This actress had to nail the comedy, but also be really serious about what she was saying. Even if it was, now you've done drugs. It was really clear from the start that with Lexi, that she had that. Hi, this is JT Underwood, hashtag darker colors. JT was like a full grown man. Out of the three kids, he definitely asked me the most questions. And they were always about motivation, the geography of where we were in the narrative shot to shot, and a lot about how his actions would translate to the final version of the film. It felt like working with someone who'd been working in this industry for 30 years. So you know the Bowman goes crazy with the baseball bat and just starts hitting all of them. Yep, 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 save it, save it, save it. Jeremiah just came in bat swinging. He had all this energy that he wasn't afraid to give to us. He has this uncanny ability to, to learn anything that we show him. So we've given this awesome scene where he's going to be taking a Back to the eiders. Action! The eiders. She had drawn them uh, with chalk. The idea was that the monsters would be made of whatever Amber drew them with. The thinking behind this was so that they could leave a colorful trail in their wake, but the main appeal was what would happen when you destroyed them. I was putting this powder, this chalk powder stuff on the ground for the shot, and Jack. <laughs> He's gonna stomp on it. It is all non-toxic and water soluble, but it literally looked like we had murdered something of some sort afterwards. According to Seth and other smart people, VFX are more effective if you implement some practical effects into the shot as well. It definitely paid off, but my lungs are trash. By hanging ping pong balls filled with chalk, we were able to get this amazing in-camera effect, which would hopefully help sell our digital monsters even more. We were out of our depth when it came to actually animating Blues and the Eiders. Matt Walker is this very talented animator who's worked on a number of amazing films and projects. Matt created dozens of animations for darker colors, bringing life to these creations and also probably convincing Seth for the first time that we might actually pull this off. Because of the large number of Eiders, there was no way to individually animate them. So we went with the video game approach where we had the animator create a series of walks, runs, jumps, dangling, all which could be looped or created and stitched into whatever shot we needed. So here's what a standard plate usually looked like. Obviously, I'd add the eiders, bringing Matt's animation cycles right into After Effects using Element 3D. Then additionally, I'd layer in a bunch of smoke, fog, and dust elements from our friends at Action VFX. And then you put it all together and you get this. It looks like a butt. No, it doesn't. He is right, though. 
Enter SuperComp, part of the powerful new VFX suite from Red Giant. SuperComp is a dockable compositing UI that works seamlessly within After Effects. SuperComp communicates upward with layers, so if you add a glow to a lower layer, it will wrap that glow around layers above it. If you add a light wrap or haze to a top layer, all lower layers will influence that haze and light wrap. This tool has absolutely changed my life, giving me better results than I've ever been able to achieve on my own, and with far less time and effort. But as we all know, visual effects aren't always monsters and fire and spectacle, it's also the unseen stuff. Our super packed two and a half day schedule meant we were moving fast, and when you move fast, sometimes you get sloppy. Roll camera. Oh, you're back. Sorry. <laughs> Rolling. Take this backpack for instance. It doesn't really belong there, and we didn't have time to move it with our actual hands and get another take, but thankfully we could just get rid of it in post. With computers? Computers are nature's gift to us. Even though, man, we even though we created them. Another amazing part of the VFX Suite is Spot Clone Tracker. Spot Clone Tracker makes it easy to remove things from your footage, even and especially if those things are in motion, with, no joke, one of the most reliable trackers I've ever used. And then there's Kingpin Tracker, VFX Suite's planar tracking tool that allows you to track planes and surfaces with amazing results, something you used to have to step out of After Effects to do in a third-party environment. With Kingpin Tracker, you can track surfaces even as they leave or enter frame. Do you understand how magical this is? I use it all over the place, like adding the drawings to the notebook and adding damage and blue crayon to the car. Crayon, right? The big blue one? When it came to blues, um, we knew that this was going to be kind of the end monster, so it needed to be the biggest and the baddest and the scariest. One of the unexpected benefits of having monsters that look like kids' drawings is that they didn't have to look perfect, which meant that, even though I had absolutely zero experience modeling 3D characters, I could open up Cinema 4D and, after watching a quick YouTube tutorial, build a monster in an afternoon. In Cinema 4D, I took Seth's model of blues and then tried to optimize and make him into a model that could be rigged and animated. It had sprung from you know, a blue crayon drawing. When it's realized in three dimensions, its mass is gonna be made out of crayon or wax. So just like with the Eiders, the physical makeup of the monster, in this case, crayon wax, provided a vulnerability with exciting visual implications. And by that I mean, we can melt it with fire. I can't tell you enough, do not do this at home. It will blow up on you, okay? Okay. Fire was actually a really easy effect. It was mostly a fire stock element, combined with an instance of trap code particular for the aerosol spray, integrated into the scene with SuperComp, using SuperComp's amazing built-in fire and explosion presets. Then for the melting, we used a state-of-the-art process called dripping paint on a child. Oh my god! Oh, it's on my face! Three, two, one! That's good. Yes, that's it. When I got up this morning, I thought to myself, I want Seth's insides outside. On the outside. I want his face <laughs> off. I want his insides out. Even the greatest visual effects in the history of film would be outright rejected by the audience if the sound wasn't up to par. Robbie Stambler, whose credits include 10 Cloverfield Lane, Overlord, and multiple Star Wars, saw to it that our film never had to worry about that. Literally giving every creature its own distinct voice and character. Oh and making sure that every hit, swing, and jump had maximum impact. This, you know, pretty standard. But then you take a copy of that and you distort it to garbage. Sounds like this. Ugh. And then you combine that with a bunch of other things. And there's a part of it that's super distorted and gross that simulates the way you would hear something really loud in real life. And it's hopefully shocking. Make it sound expensive, Robbie. When we originally talked about the arm gun, her arm was in a cast. Well, as the production you know, moved along, we lost the cast, and she was going to draw, actually draw on her arm. This gun would break out into multiple guns because, you know, from a kid's perspective, what's better than one gun? It's, you know... It's a huge gun. And a bunch of small guns combined. The arm gun was a 2.5D rig assembled and rigged in After Effects, and then lit up using Optical Glow, VFX Suite's crazy fast and gorgeous photorealistic glow tool. You should have drawn a bigger gun. Sparkle Charcoal was this very crude 3D model that's actually barely even animated, but she really comes to life because she's swimming in dozens of instances of trap code particular, using fluid dynamics to create really mesmerizing streams of glitter. The color grade was done by Ryan McNeil of RKM Studios, using Magic Bullet Suite and DaVinci Resolve. We talk a lot about how Magic Bullet brings powerful color tools to editing apps like Adobe Premiere and Final Cut Pro, but even a seasoned colorist can benefit from the 200 customizable presets in Magic Bullet looks, or the cinematic texture and film grain of Magic Bullet Renoiser. This brings a whole new degree of muscle to a Resolve color workflow. And between two cameras, over 100 VFX shots, and the word color literally being in your title, you're gonna want all the muscle you can get.
What's up, earmuffs? That's me! I love it! So, in conclusion... Every film is difficult. Like Spielberg said, it's an unnatural act. And he usually feels that way. He spent months planning, only to get there on the day and have to make it all up again. We're so behind. But, if you surround yourself with the right people, and the right tools, you can do more than just make the thing. You can bring it to life.